All right, folks, we're getting to the end of the Civil War, to the end of our series on YouTube. And we've talked about the war, battles, strategies, generals, things like that, uh, and also the war away from the war, from the battles, we'll say, what I, that, I mean, the home front, politics, the economy, emancipation. And when we last spoke, we're talking about the set of turnarounds and triumphs that the Union armies found in the summer and fall of uh, 1863. Large Union victories, Gettysburg, Pittsburgh, uh, which Moreland came around at the same time. Every time, right? Anyway, what we said at the time uh, was these are turning points in the war, moments when it was certain that the U.S. was going to win the Civil War, uh, but then it would kind of become eras of doubt were they going to win. The outcome of the war remained uncertain. So the outcome of the war remained uncertain until the summer of 64, for sure, when the Union reached its absolute low point during July and August. So we'll talk about these last campaigns of Virginia, Georgia, Carolinas, uh, with the emphasis on Grant and Sherman. And also we'll discuss uh, Lincoln's assassination, uh, just the cost of the war. In many ways, you want to think about a cost. So there was considerable optimism on both sides by this point of 63, 64. Following the battles of Chattanooga, Lincoln brought in U.S. Grant uh, to the east to take command of all the U.S. armies. Grant was promoted to Lieutenant General, which was, uh, he was the first person since George Washington to have that rank. In fact, Congress had never really wanted anyone to have the same rank as Washington. It's a testament to the belief and enthusiasm for Grant um, that this was changed for him. So Grant's plan was to apply pressure simultaneously across the entire Confederacy. Uh, everywhere possible to stretch the military resources and civilian resolve of the Confederacy. Um, they thought that eventually the Confederacy just wouldn't be able to continue fighting. Uh, Lincoln and Grant thought the war would be won in the West, but they understood that more people was looking to the East. There's more people that live there. People think about it more to just, you know, that's going to decide who was winning the way they decided that Grant, they decided that Grant had to come East. Northern public demanded that he come to Virginia and confront Lee. So we have the greatest United States general facing the best Confederate general. Grant's final plan envisioned several minor offensive and two major ones. He would take 165,000 soldiers in the Army of the Potomac and confront Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, which was about 65,000 people. Sherman, meanwhile, would take about 100,000 men out of Chattanooga and move toward Atlanta. And Atlanta was a great center of transportation, supply, manufacturing, etc., for the Confederacy. So Sherman's target is Atlanta, and Grant's target is Lee. So once Sherman had taken Atlanta, the idea that was he would move uh, into Georgia's countryside, lay waste to the economic base of the Confederacy, destroy food, production, rail lines, manufacturing. He believed that, quote, they should, well, that they should, quote, make war so terrible that they will realize it's folly. So he wanted to wage war in a way that would bring hardship to the Confederacy. Not gonna, ki not gonna kill civilians, but just destroy anything that may be used to support the war effort. Crops, live co livestock, railroad tracks, factories, all that. Just going to make suffering widespread. Sherman and Grant uh, argue that this was ultimately a more humane and effective way to wage the war. Better to burn crops uh, and end the war early. So they, in light of the uh, this set of movements, uh, these plans, uh, the northern people had high expectations in the spring of '64. Grant was in the east. He was. He had known nothing but success in the West. Northern armies had tasted victory against Lee in the preceding summer. And Sherman looked poised, or positioned, we'll say, to take Atlanta. This was going to be it. This was the path for U.S. victory after this long war. However, in the Confederacy, the people out there had optimism as well in the spring of 64. You wouldn't think they would necessarily, right? But 
they did. They're not ready to give up. There was conference that Lee could keep the war going as long as needed. And of course, both fronts were relatively confident in the spring of 64. But as the war heated up in the spring and summer of that year, the U.S. morale quickly plummeted. Between May and August of 64, there's a growing sense of doubt as to whether or not the Confederacy could be confeat, defeated. Uh, this was not a question of whether or not the U.S. had the power. It was a question of whether they had the will to continue this long fight, just keep spending this money questioning this. Sherman's campaign got off to a good start, but it slowed down. Out of Chattanooga, he moved straight toward Atlanta, but not fighting a lot of big battles. Um, he left early, in early May, just as Grant wanted to do, to lay siege on Atlanta by mid-July. He had cornered the CSA army in Atlanta, uh, but he had just not captured it yet. And what the people wanted was an unequivocal victory. They wanted to hear that Atlanta had fallen, and they said instead it was at a stalemate. No big battle, army intact, Atlanta's still sitting there. There's no occasion for rejoicing in Virginia either. Lee and Grant, Lee and Grant uh, came to confronted each other in the first week of May of 64. In the next few months, or saw a series of bloody battles. Uh, it was actually the bloodiest of the entire war. It exceeds anything that had come before, which is difficult for people to come to terms with. So by 64, both the Northern and Southern people had gotten used to large casualty figures, but nothing like what was happening in the summer of 64. These are staggering numbers. And it wasn't that there would just be a big battle followed by a period of relative calm. It just seemed like an endless stream of battles with really high casualty numbers. Something like 3,000 casualties a day in this period. And by the time they got to the Battle of Petersburg, they had gotten to 100,000 casualties between them. So Grant had pushed Lee all the way back to Richmond, but not captured Richmond, uh, just as in the case of Atlanta. Grant, in particular, got a reputation, though, as a butcher, particularly among the Democrats. There was an enormous change in attitude between May and the middle of June when the Union Army settled in for the siege of Petersburg. A lot of the excitement around Grant was diminishing. And of course, from Grant's point of view, he was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. Pin Lee's army down, tire them out. Uh, and this was the thing he was... This uh, was, he wasn't winning clearly, I guess we'll say. It's not an unequivocal battle victory. It's just slow, it's public relations issues, right? Um, they're added on to Sherman's failure to take Atlanta, Northern morale uh, kept falling. People were worried that uh, it was just not worth the cost to continue this battle to bring these states back into the Union. And Lincoln, um, across the North, there was tre tremendous war weariness that summer, uh, 66,000 casualties in Grant's army alone, uh, great bitterness against the draft that summer. Um, and in the end, only about six or 7% of all Union soldiers were actually drafted, but there was a tremendous resentment, resentment against it, especially among peace Democrats who were known as copperheads. And these copperheads uh, actually were engaging in mechanizations and conspiracies to overthrow the Union. Uh, there was an effort even within the Republican Party in May, June of 64 to dump Lincoln for another candidate named Salmon Chase, uh, Lincoln's own attorney general, um, or George C. Fremont, who is the Republican presidential candidate from 1856. Uh, Lincoln was pretty convinced that he was not going to win the reelection. The Democrats nominated George B. McClellan, Lincoln's old general, and the Democrats were a really odd party during the war. Many of them truly wanted to sue for a negotiated peace, but they would always say they wanted a negotiated peace from the South and restore the Union. Uh, these Democrats painted Lincoln and Republicans as what they constantly called miscegenation, uh, miscegenationists. Excuse me. Uh, they use the term all the time, misogyny, miscegenistic. Um, the Republicans were going to force black and white people to marry each other, basically, is what we're looking at. They um, called Abraham Lincoln uh, the widow maker, said he was uh, 
that he uh, should wear a bloody shirt. They were blaming Lincoln for all the deaths. And we've spoken several times uh, over and over really about Lincoln's true stance on race, emancipation and all. Uh, and there's a, a, lot, a changing event, a telling event at least we'll say in August of 64, when Lincoln invited Frederick Douglass to come to the White House. And Douglass had been there before the prior year to complain about unequal pay and discrimination against uh, black troops in the army. Uh, but this time Lincoln invited Douglas. They sat down for approximately an hour and Lincoln asked Douglas to try and get as many enslaved people into the North before election day as possible. Lincoln believed he wasn't going to be reelected and he wanted as many enslaved people as possible to be secure within union lines and somehow legally free under the Emancipation Proclamation. This would be prior to McClellan winning the election. And of course, Douglas was very surprised by this. Uh, he's, Douglas left the White House with a new conception of Lincoln, and Douglas started writing all his friends in the abolition movements, people who'd been recruiting African American troops. He was saying, quote, help me, we're gonna funnel slaves out of the South. I don't know how, but help me. Then, though, came the fall of Atlanta. Uh, a couple of Sheridan's uh, victories in the Shenandoah Valley, and the whole scheme was off. There was a measure of Lincoln's pessimism, though, in the summer of 64, that he was about to lose the election. Uh, now, the Confederate mor morale drops. It was edging up higher and higher, always with an eye towards the fall elections, with the hope there would be no major defeat there would, and uh, would to help Lincoln be reelected, but there was. By the time the tide turned decisively in the US, uh, favor between uh, late August and early November was heading towards the, on the US side, right? But with Northern fortunes at an all time low, a series of extremely important victories began in August. Uh, first is the port of Mobile Bay, uh, it was a key Confederate port. I was closed by Admiral David Fagro in August. Uh, it was a famous fight in which uh, Fagro, who was more than 60 years old at the time, uh, had somehow like lashed himself to the rigging of this vessel, which went past CSA batteries through a minefield. It was very dramatic, right? Uh, and within two weeks, Sherman captured Atlanta. The, the big victory here, right? Large morale boost, uh, an unparalleled blow to the CSA. Uh, Union General Philip Sheridan brought even more good news when he won a series of large victories in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Well, these things together, Mobile, Atlanta, Shenandoah, were reassuring Republican victory in November. Lincoln had his second term. The U.S. was clearly going to continue the fight, and all this cast his hall over the CSA. Sorry, I meant to switch that earlier. And these victories were... A large step. There's some major campaigns to be waged still. And one of them was Sherman's famous March to the Sea. He left Atlanta in November and struck out across Georgia. His orders were explicit. Quote, clean the country of railroad tracks and supplies, every wagon, horse, mule, and hoof of sock, as well as the Negro. And Sherman said, quote, I intend to move through Georgia, smashing things to the sea. I can make Georgia howl. And he did. It's a 60 mile wide swath through the state that left destruction everywhere. He went from Atlanta to Savannah, averaging about 10 miles a day. Uh, and once he got to the coast, he, quote, presented Savannah as a Christmas gift to Lincoln. Uh, and this was, he caused immense damage in Georgia approximately $100 million in mid-19th I mean, mid century dollars. Uh, he said, they used, Sherman said, they used about 20% of what they came across and wasted the rest of it. Uh, and there was essentially no opposition to Sherman, so he's just going right through with very little, uh, little opposition. Um, one CSA officer said Sherman's past was littered in putrefied carcasses of cattle, horses, and other livestock. He described this terrible stench as well. Uh, Sherman had followed his plan, and he had demonstrated that the U.S. Army could march right through the heartland of the CSA, and there was nothing that the Confederates could really do about it. And in the process, he destroyed a good deal of the logistical capacity of the CSA. 
Uh, later, he turned north, as you can see on this map here, uh, through South Carolina, goes to Columbia, and into North Carolina, um, and he stops right outside Durham, and that's uh, in March 65, and he gets there. Uh, Lee and Grant remain mirrored in the siege of warfare outside of Petersburg and Richmond while all of this is happening with Sherman. Uh, and it was a miserable ordeal that lasted nine months with Grant relentlessly extending his lines further west, stretching Lee more thinly and more thinly. Uh, and on the 1st of April, 1865, uh, it was a massive a U.S. assault on Lee's uh, far right flank that broke through. Um, when that happened, Lee had no choice but to abandon Petersburg, and he left that town, uh, left Richmond uncovered, and the CSA government abandoned its capital on April the 2nd, 65. So Grant finally accomplished what he was out to do, pin down Lee's army and forced it to move on. Uh, Lee tried to escape to the west, hoping to get far enough so he could turn south and unite with other forces in North Carolina, but Grant just kept cutting him off, wouldn't let him. And finally, by April 9th of 65, uh, the CSA uh, Army in Northern Virginia was surrounded. Uh, so as you're probably all aware, the war finished with the surrender of Appomattox, and then with the surrender of Joseph Johnson to Sherman uh, in, what was in, North, in North Carolina on April 26th of 65. So Lee and Grant met at the McClellan's house at Appomattox. Uh, they sat down in the parlor of this house and Grant gave Lee the terms. And Lee, as the story goes, dressed up in his finest clothing, he wore his sword, he expected to do this kind of traditional surrender where he would uh, give his sword over to Grant. But Grant just said, quote, I don't want your sword, go home. And Grant offered a very generous surrender terms according to Lincoln's instructions. He, Grant later remembered that he was, quote, sad and depressed that the downfall of a foe who had fought so long and valiantly and had suffered so much for a cause, though the cause was, I believe, one of the worst for which people ever fought. So, Lee had sent a note to uh, his army and says, quote, please meet me to consider terms of surrender. Sorry, to, he sent that note to Grant's army. And the news just spread really quickly that this was going to, uh, the war was going to be ending. People, people are, soldiers are firing pistols, cheering. Uh, and Grant put out an order uh, all through his army that there'd be no celebrations. Uh, was Grant was already understanding that the surrender had to be political. By that, I mean there would be tremendous bitterness to deal with after the actual fighting of the war, right? So the official surrender, uh, April 12th, 1865, at Adamax Courthouse, uh, four years to the day after the CSA had fired on Fort Sumter. And Lincoln did not have much time, as you see, uh, he was assassinated two days later on April the 14th. Um, Lincoln was inaugurated for his second presidential term on Saturday, March 4th, 1865. And apparently weeks of rain had the Capitol thick with mud and all this water. And when Lincoln took his oath of office, he was actually under the newly completed uh, Capitol, the dome. Uh, and Lincoln delivered a speech that somehow combined the disparative themes of union, emancipation, and emancipation that had threatened to derail the war effort so many times. He reminded the audience of his, of his first inauguration when, quote, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and make and divide efforts by negotiation. Both parties depreciated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish, and the war came. Oh, there you are. And Lincoln remembered a quote, uh, what did he say? Uh, Neither party expected for the war 
the magnitude or the duration which has, has, which has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. And each evokes his aid against the other. So Lincoln focused, though, again on slavery, specifically, quote, that, uh, quote, American slavery is one of those offenses which God now wills to remove and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe do. So this war was the nation's punishment for slavery. Uh, Lincoln has really changed, if you can see. And he didn't leave, he wasn't like blaming just the Confederacy. Uh, he said, quote, uh, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must. And Lincoln was 56 years old. Here, uh, you, know, you can see here, he had uh, aged. But I had a, eh, yeah, four days, and then, okay, there you go. Um, he had aged, uh, most presidents age during their terms, uh, but this was pretty striking here. Uh, and as you're aware, um, you know, obviously Lincoln was very overjoyed with this victory, and he got to relax, and he went to the theater uh, in the middle of a, right in the middle of a play, what was it called My American Cousin, I believe, and apparently the production stopped as, it, as they sat down, and people applauded, uh, and they began to watch the play, and they'd been there a little while when uh, John Wilkes Booth of the famous Booth acting family, which was apparently one of the famous families in the country, uh, snuck into the uh, back of the box and shot Lincoln in the back of the head. Uh, he jumped out of the box in which he broke his leg and hobbled off having shouted sic semper tyrannis, which is uh, thus ever to tyrants, which is the state motto of Virginia. Uh, Lincoln was carried across the street and he died the next morning. The people in the North were mourning, of course, but also outraged. There was blame of the Confederacy. Um, Booth, of course, was acting alone with a little help from some conspirators. Uh, the word spread uh, incredible hatred for the South across the North. Um, Booth was eventually shot as he was being captured, uh, so he never stood trial. And there were four co conspirators uh, who were hanged. Rumors that one of them was probably innocent. Uh, Lincoln was gone and Andrew Johnson of Tennessee replaced him, the vice president. Um, we'll talk more about him next time. Uh, and the war extracted an enormous human toll and material costs. Uh, some figures uh, with casualties, about 620,000 people died. 320,000 in the north, 260,000 in the south. All in all, 1.1 million people were killed and wounded. Uh, and of those, this is a kicker here, apparently of those who died, two-thirds died of disease. Things from like measles, dysentery, chronic diarrhea, typhoid, typhoid fever, etc. So this is a massive toll. Um, economically, that's more for debate. Uh, the federal budget, though, in 1860 was... 63 million dollars and in 65 it was 1.3 billion and the csa budget would have added that added on to that by quite a bit uh by 1879 the cost of um the cost of us was about 6.1 billion uh this pensions other costs will continue long after the war to so the war is used People were still paying for the war as long as soldiers were still alive and pensions were being given to them, to the veterans. Um, the two sides spent unprecedented amount of money on this. And the destruction of the South was catastrophic. About two thirds of the entire assessed wealth of the South was gone. And much of that, of course, in enslaved property. A quarter of all white males between the ages of 20 and 40 were dead. So if the US had lost uh, this proportion in World War II, 6.6 uh, .6 million people would have died rather than the 400,000 people who died.
about two fifths of all livestock were killed, two third of all machinery, railroads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and finally, uh, between 1860 and 1870, Northern wealth increased by 50%, while Southern wealth decreased by 60%. So what did the war settle? Uh, the nation would not be the same. Uh, question of the permanence of the Union seemed to be settled forever. Though. Still though, uh, people, from people coming out of the war, there was a sense that the Union was permanent. Uh, coming off experience. Uh, meanwhile, central government grew in size and scope and power. There were central banks, currency, regulations, higher spending. Um, with the war ending, there's questions regarding slavery. Uh, these were kind of swept away by the war. Uh, and then the ratification of the 13th Amendment in March of 1865. But if the war had done all this, it's still left unresolved how recently freed uh, African Americans would fit in to the new world. Also, is all about what was unresolved is how formally, how the former states of the CSA would come back into the Union. So here we are with the question of reconstruction. And we'll begin this unit with the with descriptions of these regions, which crept further and further apart. And I want to leave you here with uh, some imagery from uh, April of. 1865, sorry, I went the wrong way, a uh, marker of how difficult reuniting this country would be. So in the South, uh, Kate Snow, who was a Louisiana planter woman who fled over to Texas, lost most of her enslaved property. So she wrote in her diary in April of 65, quote, all are fearfully depressed. I cannot bear to hear them talk of defeat. So she still hoped that uh, Confederate armies might rally and fight to, quote, uh, to be free or die. And then on May 15th, she wrote, conquered, submission, subjugation are the words in my heart. Uh, but when she heard that uh, Booth had shot Lincoln, she celebrated. Uh, and she celebrated Booth for, quote, ridding the world of a tyrant. We are glad he is not alive to rejoice in our humiliation and insult us with his jokes. Um, now, a woman in Massachusetts named Caroline Barrett White, Caroline Barrett White, uh, wrote in her diary on April the 10th of 65, hurrah, hurrah, sound the lulled temple over Egypt's dark sea. Early this morning, our ears were greeted with the sounds of bells ringing a joyous peal. General Lee had surrounded with his whole with his whole army to General Grant. Surely this is the Lord's doing. It is a it is a marvelous thing in our eyes. And then five days later, on April the fifteenth, uh, detailing uh, Lincoln's assassination, uh, the long, which was apparently the longest entry in her diary, uh, and around the outside of the pages, she just blackened the edges, and she wrote, "quote The darkest day I ever remember." This morning, the sun rose upon a nation jubilant with victory, but it sets upon one plunged into deepest sorrow. Where will treason ever end? So, we'll end there.